Hi everybody, this is Dr. Anna, your physical geology professor. Uh, our topics today, topic today is the groundwater. As you know, groundwater probably is one of the most important chapter we're gonna learn about. And it is very important because of it's our drinking water source. Uh, the drinking water which is lying beneath the surface of the earth is what we call groundwater. Uh, the main source of the groundwater is the rain and the snow, of course, and about 15% of every precipitation you can imagine will end up by infiltration in the groundwater. Uh, if you took all the groundwater out, it would make a 10 meter deep lake around the earth, all the way through around the earth. We have a couple of things we have to talk about and the first one is the porosity and to understand groundwater movement you really have to know about the porosity and permeability of the rock. The porosity is the percentage of the rock volume which can hold water. Just about every kind of rocks will have some kind of porosity. We have two kinds, one is the primary, the other one is the secondary. When you're thinking of primary porosity, you have to think about as the grains are settling down, there will be that some pores in between the grains. Uh, therefore, the porosity will depend on the size, the shape, and the arrangement of the particles in the rocks. The other one is the secondary porosity. The secondary porosity forms when the rock already become rock, and then something happens like uh, fracturing, dissolution, or weathering. Um, most igneous and metamorphic rocks basically just have secondary porosity, almost always just by faulting or, or, or plate tectonics. Um, just uh, Sedimentary rocks have much more primary porosity than secondary. Sec secondary can be important because a lot of the times it can be actually enhanced by secondary porosity. The primary can be enhanced by secondary porosity. So this picture shows you some secondary porosity. See these are all fault lines and along the fault lines the, the water can actually move pretty easily and the layers. So fault lines and rayers, these are secondary porosity. Like when you're in Franklin County or around Dixie Caverns, uh, you've got to kind of imagine that this is what happens, that we only have secondary porosity. And uh, when you drill a water well, you have a chance to hit the fault line along which the water is moving, or you have a chance that you don't. So you never can ask your neighbor, hey, how, how deep is your well? And thinking that your well must be the same depth, because it might be that one of your neighbor has a 50 feet well and it gives a lot of good water. But if you have uh, an area, you can drill down like 100 feet and you get no water. Or you can drill down like 200 feet and you get a bunch of really good water. So it just depends how the secondary porosity actually is distributed in the area. This here, just the summary figure of the primary and the secondary porosity. So I hope now you understand those two and you can actually separate them. There are rocks such as conglomerate, sandstone and limestone which tend to have large porosity and can hold considerable amount of water. Um, originally, if you have a loose sediment, they have much higher porosity but then it can be really lessened by compaction. Uh, although porosity determines how much water a, hold can, a rock can hold, it will not be able to tell you how much water actually can transport. And that is, or ex how much can be extracted, that is what is defined by the word called permeability. Permeability is the amount of material which can actually transmit through um, the rocks and uh, it depends not only the porosity but also on the size and the interconnection inner connection interconnection of the pores so let's say if you have pores like this and they are absolutely separated from each other you can have as much as you want water will not be able to go through to go through they have to have these little teeny tiny neck areas 
through which they can actually, these pores are interconnected. So therefore, the water can move from pore to pore, so it's permeable. I hope you understand what I'm saying. But when you actually play this slide, too, this slide will be animated so you can see it's moving. Uh, not this one, so, 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 sorry. This one is the one which is uh, moving. And you will see that these pores actually never will fill up or empty out. So these are just sitting there. So these are not part of the permeability. So the, the amount of porosity will not define the permeability. The permeability is de defined by the interconnection of these holes. If they have little tube or neck areas where they connect with each other, so actually the material can go through. So different rocks will have different porosity and permeability. Like if you think, think of gravel, it has high porosity and good permeability. The sand will have relatively good porosity and good permeability. And as you get to the clay, that has really high porosity but very poor permeability. So it's very important that the size of the pores if they are too small, then it just won't let the water go through because the water has the high surface tension. Um, so, here's my wine for tonight. I'm drinking a bit. Now, you don't have to follow me because especially if you're less than 21, do not drink. But if you're more, I hope you can study well. As I just mentioned, the shale probably has the highest porosity. Uh, it has more uh, porosity than sandstone, but the permeability is basically non-existent because the pores are too small, and as the, the surface tension of the water is too high, it actually gets clogged in the pores, so it won't be able to move through at all. So remember, actually, clay is the one which is absolutely unable to transport water. Now, the next question is how fast the water is actually moving in the rocks. And uh, it, the, it can be one meter per day, or it can be as slow as one meter per year, but the highest ever measured is about 250 meters per day, which means it flows almost as fast as a river. So if you think about, uh, and this happens in limestone, this here is uh, the Florida Aquifer, which Florida is nothing but limestone, and in the limestone, the water moves under water, uh, basically underground rivers, and it can move really fast. So if you put some bad stuff at Gainesville, like up north, it can get to Everglades really, really quickly because the whole system is nothing but just the uh, interconnected uh, flow of, of caves. And in the caves, the water is flowing all the time. Some more te terminology. Um, when you have a layer which is permeable and can transport fluid, we call it aquifer. Aqua means water. So aquifer is uh, a layer which can transport and hold liquid. Then you have the so-called, uh, like the best aquifer would be like a well um, sorted and well rounded um, pebbles or conglomerate or something like that. Then the, the opposite is when it cannot let water through at all and that is what we call aquiclude and that's clay or mudstone. And then we have rocks which are in between like they can somewhat hold water, they have some porosity, permeability is not so big and we call it aquitar and that is silt. Silt is a typical aquitard. aquitard. An aquifer, you have to imagine an aquifer as an underground formation, so it's under the surface, it's a formation, uh, which is permeable rocks, such as sandstone. It could also be loose material, by the way. And um, it can produce useful quantities of water when uh, tapped by a well. Uh, Basically, it can give enough water to supply people. Uh, aquifers can come in different sizes. They can be really small. They can be really, really big. Uh, it could be like 
thousands of square kilometers underneath of the earth. Like one of the best example is the the Ogallala Aquifer. As you can see, it's, it's underneath of um, South Dakota and Nebraska and Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas all the way. So that's the Ogallala Aquifer. And this is the biggest one in the U.S. And it's about 20% of the irrigated land in the U.S. in the high plains is uh, irrigated from this aquifer. Uh, the problem is that uh, they withdraw about 14 billion gallons per day. So this here is a so-called paleo aquifer, which means it doesn't get um, recharged anymore because it's rather a dry area. So therefore, the water levels are dropping for, from pulling out this much water from the system. This here is the famous Florida aquifer. The Florida aquifer is just underneath of Florida all over uh, and it's all interconnected and pollution travels in these rocks, these limestones really, really easily. So it's not a good idea. The next thing we have to talk about is the groundwater table. And um, you have to understand that the the water table has some complications because of the high surface tension of the water and the capillary action. So when we talk about capillarity, what we're talking about is really like the, if you have a bucket of water and you put these glass tubes in it, depending on the width of the glass tube, the water will go up in the glass tube. And if it's narrower, the water goes up a little bit less than, no, higher than when it's wider. When it's wider, it doesn't go up that much. So that's the capillary action. And it's the reason for the capillary action is the high surface tension of the water. Like when you have some water spill and you put like a paper towel and you can just see how the water goes up in the paper towel. And that is because of the high surface tension of the, of the water. So let's draw the water table. When we do the water table, you have to have, this is the surface, and these are the grains in the ground. Okay, so there are areas where the water is partially, the, the, This will be the, the red color will be the water. So the water is coming in from the surface to the ground. And as it goes through, it will actually glue to some of the, some of the pores like this. So on top, there will be some uh, pore which filled up with water and some which doesn't. And there will be a surface which is going to be really, really irregular below which every pore is going to be filled up with water. So the boundary between the, the zone where it's partially filled up versus the zone where it's completely filled up is what we call water table. And the zone where the water is partially filling the, the pores is the zone of aeration. And this is the zone of saturation. So the zone of saturation, zone of aeration, and the, this is the water table, this irregular surface. Right above that, so that's the water table. That right above the water table, the water actually is moving up and that is what we call capillary, capillary fringe. I just put CAP. It's in the text, it's capillary fringe. So if I go back to this slide, here is the saturated zone, zone of aeration, the capillary fringe. All these words are on this, uh, on this slide so you can really uh, read it and learn it. 
or you can use this more uh, sing, uh, simplified drawing. Here is the zone of aeration, zone of saturation, and here is the capillary fringe right here. The next thing we have to talk about is the perch water table. So when you have a perch water table, that just means that above the main water table, and we, we show the water table with dotted lines, and we put this little triangle thingy on it, which shows that that's the water table. But if you have a clay, the clay is aquiclude, aqui remember, it doesn't let water through. So when you have a little clay lens, actually it will make a little temporary water table. And if you happen to be in the area where you have perch water table, then your well could be very, very shallow, which I wouldn't use because when the well is shallow, that means that there is not enough infiltration to actually get out of the bad stuff like bacteria and things from animal waste. But this is the perch water table. When you have a clay lens above the main water table, that clay lens actually will produce a little temporary water table right in that area. The shape of the water table. The shape of the water table is usually the replica of the surface. So uh, therefore it is higher underneath of the mountains or hills and lower underneath of the valleys. Uh, the irregular, irregularities, irregularities of the water table can be also caused by the irregular uh, precipitation pattern and different permeability. So when, whenever the water table is never going to be exactly the same. When it's raining, it goes up, and when it's drought, it goes down. So it just depends what happens. Uh, now, if you have a dry season, if your well is really, really shallow, it might actually die, uh, dry out, which is not a good idea. Two more words you have to know about the groundwater movement. The recharge means that the water enters the system, and the discharge is when the water leaves the system. And I'm going to finish this segment right here, and I will continue it in the next segment.